The importance of having and maintaining a well-stocked first aid kit cannot be overstressed. Studies show that most wounds involving heavy bleeding are survivable. The problem is most people bleed out before help can arrive. In this video, I will be discussing the essential items needed for an emergency first aid kit or individual first aid kit, sometimes referred to as an IFAC. The best part, it all fits in a quart size Ziploc bag. What's in my IFAC? Stick around and find out. Before we get to the contents of my IFAC or individual first aid kit, I want you to understand that this is not a boo-boo kit. It's not meant to deal with sprains or minor cuts or bruises. It is meant to deal with major trauma, including heavy bleeding. Uh, any trauma kit has to comply with the MARCH algorithm, M-A-R-C-H, which stands for massive bleeding, airway, respiratory, circulation, and head injury. The number one preventable cause of death is bleeding. The second disclaimer that I'd like to make is that everything that we're going to discuss, so all of the equipment contained in the IFAC, as well as the various techniques used in deploying and employing that equipment, needs to be trained on. This is not a training video. You need to get training yourself. You need to get trained on all of these items. I'll discuss where you can get that training later on in the video, but please understand we're only discussing the contents of the IFAC in this video. So we're gonna get started by laying everything out on the table and then I'll go through each item one by one. Now is a good time to like this video and please subscribe to our channel. So the first couple of items we're gonna cover are the accessories contained in the pack. The first accessory is a pair of blue nitrile gloves. These are latex free gloves. They are blue, not black. I know that there are a lot of people who like the black gloves. They came into vogue, I think, uh, when tattoo artists start using them because people wouldn't see blood on their hands. Um, th the problem is that if you're inspecting a victim who's down and unconscious and you're searching to see if there's an exit wound or if there are other cuts or whatever and you're you know, running your hands over their body, you're not going to see blood on black gloves as well as you will on blue gloves. So it's important to get blue or some other color, just avoid the black gloves. So one pair nitrile latex free gloves. Second item is a pair of shears. These are typical EMT shears. You may have to cut away clothing. You may have to cut somebody out of a seat belt. You, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why you might need a pair of shears. So a good set of EMT shears, very important in every trauma kit. Next item is a Sharpie. This Sharpie writes in black, you can use any color. Uh, the importance of a Sharpie is in the event that you apply a tourniquet, for example, you would write down the time that you apply the tourniquet. Um, if you administered any other kind of first aid or whatever, you might consider writing that down also. Uh, good places to write are right at the place of the tourniquet or on the patient's forehead. Uh, that'll you know, certainly be seen by uh, emergency first responders when they arrive and uh, you know, render assistance. Uh, the next item is some surgical tape. Um, surgical tape has a lot of different uses. Obviously, the primary use is to attach a gauze or some other you know, kind of uh, item to the body, but uh, surgical tape, very important. Along that uh, line, duct tape. I keep a little bit of duct tape in my IFAC. You can keep it folded up like this or in a roll. Duct tape is uh, the wonder tool. Uh, it's a thousand and one uses, probably more than a thousand and one, but not a bad idea to have some duct tape in your kit. Um, I keep a lighter in the kit. Uh, fire is something that man has enjoyed the ability to make for quite some time now. Uh, if you have to sterilize something, if you have to see, if you have uh, some other reason why you need fire, it's not a terrible idea to have a, a small Bic lighter in your kit. Uh, along those lines also, I keep a small pen light. This is the type that doctors typically have in their, you know, in their, uh, in their coats. It's a useful for checking pupil dilation. Uh, if it's dark and you're looking for something, it's great uh, if you have a pen light as opposed to trying to wave around a, an open flame from a, a lighter. But a pen light is the last uh, accessory contained in the pack. So those are the accessories. 
So the first piece of life-saving medical equipment that we have in the trauma kit is a cat tourniquet. I did a video on cat tourniquets and their application a little while ago, and we will post a card above so you can look at that video. Um, the primary objective when dealing with any heavy bleeding, whether it's a puncture wound, gunshot wound, open fracture, slash type wound, is to keep the blood in the body. Uh, that means the limbs, the head, and the torso. The best way to stop bleeding on an extremity is with a combat application tourniquet or CAT tourniquet, otherwise known as the CAT tourniquet. Um, before I say anything else, when you're purchasing a CAT tourniquet, make sure you buy one from a reputable dealer. Uh, there are knockoffs available online where you can get, you know, like five for $20 or something like that. You're not doing yourself any favors by trying to get a bargain when you purchase some of this equipment. Some of this equipment is a little bit expensive. However, you will rely on it to save your or someone else's life. And when you use a cheap tourniquet and the windlass snaps or, uh, the fabric, uh, you know, doesn't contract, and uh, you're trying to you know, tighten it down and meanwhile someone, either you or someone else, is bleeding out, the $10 that you saved on the cheap knockoff tourniquet doesn't seem like it was worth it at that point. So it's very important to buy a, a you know, brand name quality tourniquet. Uh, the CAT tourniquet was developed by a guy, uh, he was a master sergeant in the army named Ted Westmoreland. And it is a really the, it's a true one-handed tourniquet. It's proven to be 100% effective by the United States Army's Institute of Surgical Research. Uh, it was first adopted by the Special Operations Command, I think in 2005, and it became the official tourniquet of all the armed forces in the United States in 2006. Uh, so please refer to the CAT tourniquet video that we made previously on how to deploy and employ the CAT tourniquet. The next piece of emergency gear we keep in the kit is a four inch emergency bandage, also known as the Israeli bandage. Uh, it was nicknamed the Israeli bandage by U US troops back in, I think, 2001, when it was, it was adopted by the US Army's 75th Ranger Regiment, and it was used extensively during the Gulf War. Uh, the Israeli bandage was conceived and uh, invented by an American-born Israeli combat medic who was in the IDF named Bernard Ben Natan. It's an extremely versatile bandage. It can be deployed one-handed like a cat tourniquet. However, unlike a cat tourniquet, the Israeli bandage can be used at either a junctional wound, uh, such as something in an armpit or a hip, and can also be deployed on a torso or a head, uh, which is something that you can't use a regular cat tourniquet for. Now the tourniquet comes double wrapped. I'm going to show you a photo of how it comes wrapped uh, when you buy it from the factory. Uh, it's an elasticized bandage with a non-adhesive bandage that's sewn in. And uh, when I say it comes double wrapped, the outside is typically encased in a gray, uh, tough plastic wrapping. And then once you take off the outside wrapping, there's an interior wrapping, which still keeps the uh, emergency bandage sterile. Once you open up the emergency bandage, you can open it up by tearing open the outside uh, plastic and then you can deploy it. The interesting thing about this bandage is that it has a built-in pressure bar. Let me just get it open. So there's two features that are really unique to the Israeli bandage. The first thing is that when you open it up, there's a large uh, absorbent pad which is attached to the bandage. It won't fall off. The second thing is you see this cleat on the outside. And um, the way that this is deployed is when it's wrapped around, um, around the, the, the patient, after it's wrapped one time, you can pass the fabric through the cleat and then reverse it and you can use the cleat as a uh, pressure point. Uh, so you can make um, a very, very significant pressure with this bandage, and that certainly helps to stop, uh, you know, any kind of heavy bleeding you might encounter. Third thing that's interesting is the way that it's designed is that at every uh, fold, there's a little piece of thread that comes right off, but it will prevent it from unrolling and rolling, you know, out on, in, on the ground and uh, becoming unsterile or, you know, dirty. Uh, so aside from the pressure bar that makes the bandaging easier, there is a closure bar 
at the other end. So once you finally completely open it, after you've wrapped the wound and you've gotten sufficient um, pressure using the cleat, you can close the bandage off at the opposite end with the built-in closure bar. Uh, this means that it won't come off, it won't slip, and it clips neatly into place. And we will, like I said, do a future video on the deployment and employment of the Israeli bandage. The next item in the kit is a SWAT T tourniquet. SWAT does not stand for Special Weapons and Tactics. It stands for Stretch, Wrap, and Tuck. Uh, this is, unlike the cat tourniquet, this does not have a windlass. Um, however, this is extremely compact, it's very inexpensive, and it can be used as a tourniquet in addition to either a pressure dressing or an elastic bandage. Um, it's an excellent backup to the cat tourniquet and Israeli bandage, and uh, it's deployed very simply. Basically, all it is is a large, wide rubber sleeve. And it comes with instructions that, you know, come obviously inside the package itself, which you should um, become familiar with, but also on the tourniquet itself, there are instructions. And one of, the, uh, one of the ways to know if you're doing this right is when you stretch it, there are little symbols that are um, indicated all along the tourniquet. And when you do it correctly, the symbols will stretch out. And uh, when you read the instructions, it shows that um, when the oval turns into a circle, that's the you know, correct amount of stretch. Uh, so you could use this as a tourniquet, but you can also use it as a pressure bandage um, to you know, stop if you have heavy bleeding, but not arterial bleeding. After the wound is packed, you can use the, uh, the SWAT T to wrap up the wound and make sure that it stays tight. In addition, you might need more than one tourniquet because if someone has more than one injury that requires uh, blood stopping, um, this is a fantastic backup. Uh, you can buy them in uh, black and they also have uh, orange uh, training um, SWAT tees that you can purchase. They're all the same price, but it's a good idea to buy a training version and practice with it because you don't want to be trying to employ this uh, for the first time in under emergency situations. I, I, I promise you it won't work out well. The next item in the kit is compressed gauze. Uh, we keep two kinds of compressed gauze. This is ordinary typical compressed gauze, which is just made out of cotton, and also quick clot compressed gauze in a Z-fold uh, configuration. Uh, the difference, basic difference is that uh, the ordinary compressed gauze does not have any kind of hemostatic or clotting agent, whereas the quick clot gauze is impregnated with click, quick clot, which is a hemostatic agent which aids in blood clotting. Uh, the, the way that you use the non-hemostatic gauze, or actually you use them both the same way, but the way that you would uh, deploy this gauze is you take it out of the packaging, open it up, and then what you would do is, uh, for a puncture wound, you'd make a, 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 a knot at the end of one end of the gauze, and then you'd start packing it into the wound. And you pack it and pack it and pack it and pack it until you can't pack any more. And then you use a pressure bandage to close the wound up. Uh, that way, the, hopefully, that'll promote good blood clotting within the wound, and uh, bleeding will stop pretty quickly. The combat gauze comes uh, also... Uh, in a Z-fold configuration, so it's easy to just take out one end, tie off a little power ball knot, stuff it into the wound, and pack it. But the difference is that this comes with impregnated with quick clot, which is, like I said, a hemostatic agent which will aid in quicker clotting. The next item is an occlusive dressing uh, known as a chest seal. Uh, this is uh, a vented seal made by a company called Hyphen, and this is the compact version comes with two seals, front and back. Uh, one is used for the entrance wound and the other is used for possible exit wound if there is one. Uh, the way that these are used is you simply, you'll separate the two, tear open the package at the notch that is indicated on either side. Um, inside the package, there is a folded up plastic seal. You remove the adhesive backing, wipe the blood off of the patient, and slap the seal over the hole or you know, slash wound or puncture wound. Um, there are two kinds of seals. There are vented and unvented. This type is vented. However, there are a lot of seals on the market that are unvented. The reason why it's important to note if the seal is vented or not vented 
is in the event of an unvented seal, uh, a mechanically induced hemothorax may develop in the lung. Uh, what that means is that pressure builds up inside the lung because of the bleeding, and you'll need to uh, relieve that pressure because what will happen is the patient will tell you, hey, you know, I can't breathe. I mean, it becomes apparent after maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And all you need to do is lift the corner of the seal up and burp the seal. And you'll hear sort of like a hiss and a <sighs> noise. And then you close it back up and keep an eye on the patient. You'll have to do that every 10 or 15 minutes. If you have a vented seal, you don't have to do it because there's a vent, a one-way vent built into these seals. So for ease of use, try to get the vented kind, but either kind works. So occlusive dressing or chest seal. The next item in the kit is a nasopharyngeal airway. This is a, essentially a rubber tube, which helps keep an airway open in the event of uh, airway blockage. Um, the good thing about the nasopharyngeal airway is that because it goes in through the nose, you can use it on a conscious patient or an unconscious patient. It does not promote any kind of gag reflex that an oral airway might. Um, it comes with a small packet of uh, lubricant. Um, it's basically like a little ketchup packet, except it has lubricant inside it. And you would use that to lubricate the stem of the airway before inserting it into the nose. If you don't have lubricant, uh, this, the lubricant doesn't come attached and very often it gets lost. You can use saliva, not your own saliva, the patient's saliva, or blood if the patient is bleeding, which is likely. Uh, blood makes a great uh, lubricant uh, if you have nothing else. So what it essentially does is it keeps the airway open and uh, even you know if the patient is unconscious. So the nasopharyngeal airway. Again, this is an item that requires training in order to use. Uh, you can't just shove it into somebody's nose. And uh, you wouldn't be doing that if you don't know how to use it anyway. So very, very important to get training on this airway. The next item is a tension pneumothorax access kit, otherwise known as a needle decompression kit. Uh, this is used to relieve a tension pneumothorax associated with the lung puncture. Uh, it comes with a needle and a catheter inside this little uh, container. And this also requires uh, specialized training to use. Do not attempt to use a decompression needle without training. Uh, you can easily result in a much worse situation than when you started with if you deploy this incorrectly. So decompression needle. The next item is an emergency blanket, sometimes referred to as a NASA blanket. It's a foil blanket inside a pouch. Uh, the emergency blanket is important because in the event of major blood loss, uh, shock typically sets in, and that's something that you definitely want to avoid, and this will help prevent your patient going into shock. In addition, heavy blood loss results in reduced body temperature, uh, which is something that this will help prevent. For every one degree of loss of body temperature, it cuts the body's ability to clot blood in half. So you lose half your clotting ability for every one degree of body temperature that you lose, which is why it's very important if you have a, you know, a patient who sustains significant blood loss, and once you've stopped the blood loss, wrap them up in an emergency blanket so that they don't go into shock and they clot a lot more easily. So emergency blanket, costs a few dollars, uh, can easily save your life. And that concludes the contents of our Ziploc individual first aid kit. Please keep in mind that purchasing one of these kits, whether you buy one on the internet or you put one together yourself, will not help you or anyone else unless you know how to use the gear that's contained inside. Any more than going out and purchasing an electric guitar will make you Eddie Van Halen. It won't. Which means you need to get training, and the best place to get that training is at stopthebleed.org. Like in all of our videos, the focus here is to help you help yourself because you are the agent in charge of your own executive protection detail, and you are always your own first responder. So remember to be, always be prepared, stay safe, God bless you, and God bless America.